Welcome back, Zach. Hey, Jonathan. So we're now going to <clears throat> go into the second part of this conversation, the parts that we only briefly touched on last time, a bit more about Comenius and in particular what he did, particularly his sort of more religious, um, let's say metaphysical even work, and also a bit more depth on this idea of being a time between worlds. But I think just so we don't forget, because you can, it's easy to forget the man himself, right. even though it was, you know, so many years ago. Um, let's begin with, let's begin there. Tell me, just reiterate who Comenius was, what he did, and particularly what you think his work indicates about what we might do today and, and, and the overlaps there. Totally. Yeah, I'm trying to find the best way in. So <clears throat> you have to think of kind of the historical stage setting on which Comenius kind of entered. Yeah. So the scene is Bohemia, which is the Czech Republic now. And in that context, in the lead up to the Thirty Years' War, you basically had the Habsburg mm -hmm. Empire and the Pope <laughs> versus this kind of like complex array of Protestant sects. Uh, and things were getting very heated. <laughs> and in fact, a, a propaganda war was beginning between the two sides using the printing press technology. Yeah. So among the Protestant sects, there was a small, radical, mystically oriented sect um, uh, built around a martyr uh, named Huss. This was called the Bohemian Brethren, or the Unity was the name of it. And so Comenius was born into this small Bohemian religious sect and eventually became its, its leader. Um, and what was unique about it was that it was <clears throat> uh, syn theologically synthetic, which means that it wasn't fundamentalist theologically. It was actually pulling on natural philosophy and pulling on Jewish traditions and Kabbalah and other things and bringing that into the Protestant context. So it was more sophisticated than your average <laughs> Protestantism of the day. And it was also completely peace oriented, which means that it was trying to foster peace between the warring Protestant sects and between the Protestants and the Catholics. <laughs> and so that made it actually persecuted by all sides. There was, they were not popular with the Protestants. They were not popular with the Catholics. They were doing something fundamentally different. And they were the first sect to actually, I believe, translate the Bible into Czech and possibly a couple other languages. So they were engaged in already. Probably Latin, presumably, right? Yeah, precisely. And so, so that's where he kind of grows up in this context. Um, but just as he's coming of age, kind of completing his studies uh, and actually taking over the leadership of a school, um, you know, the Thirty Years' War mm -hmm. breaks out, the Habsburgs move in to Bohemia, mm -hmm. all the Protestants basically flee uh, Bohemia. The brethren flee Bohemia. They are sheltered by various Protestant aristocrats. Um, literally, Comenius loses two wives to this kind of activity. He's hiding in the mountains with his manuscripts, you know, and if he gets caught, he gets basically the Inquisition type treatment. His, his, his political and religious exile. He is a political and religious exile. Um, he eventually, uh, so in that context, he remains incredibly productive. And this is how I, I don't understand how this works because I'm like dyslexic and I use a computer and I, but somehow this man with just like a quill and ink and loose papers manages to create a tremendous amount of work and remarkably innovative work in the realm of education in particular. Um, so he lands himself in the protection. I can't remember the aristocrat's name, but of a Protestant aristocrat from there, he kind of begins to issue out his educational writings and his religious and theological writings, which I don't even touch on in this paper. You do touch on them but, briefly. But yeah, yeah, that's what I'm keen to know a little bit more about as well. Yeah. And so so in that context, he <clears throat> he creates uh, a book that became basically world famous. Uh, it was called the, the door uh, uh, it's something like the doorways of language or the doorways into language. This is his first kind of picture book instructional manual. Uh, and then following that, you get the Orbis Pictus, which I discuss a lot in the, in the Perspectiva paper. Um, and in both of those cases, Comenius was doing something incredibly novel 
with printing press technology, actually inspired by the propaganda that he was seeing. Right. So the propaganda during the 30 years war, you're dealing with mostly an illiterate population. So you're dealing with propaganda that's image based and right. then images that are basically discussed beneath it. And so you get a bunch of people gathered around in the town square. One of them can read. Everyone's looking at the image. The one person who can read is like narrating the image, right? I can show a few images from share a screen if you'd like me to. Shall I do that? Just That'd be great. Yeah. Because uh-huh. this is a this is a sense of like just what blew people's minds open because yeah. Minus was able with a book to create basically the first textbook, first picture book. Right. That was teaching people Latin uh, and vocabulary um, all around the world. Right. So you can see this now, right? Yes. I'm hoping this is also being recorded. But that's Comenius, the man himself, on the back of the banknote. Jan Amos. Yeah, so yeah, the, the Czech Republic honors Comenius quite intensively. And so they put his picture on the <laughs> 200 Dutch, crown. Dutch friends and colleagues who tell me that there are lots of street names and stuff named after him as well. Yes. Um, and then this one here is Comenius in his study, by the looks of it. Um, yes. On the page of Didacta, right? Yeah. And then just give, giving people a flavor of this. This looks a bit more like the. So this is a chapter on geometry from the Orbis Pictus. And so it's a little bit hard to see, but like if you look to the tower on the right, mm-hmm. you'll see a little two up above and a little four to the right of it. Yeah. And then that two and four go down to the text below where you're given the words for right. that part of the picture. Right. And then you're given the words in your native language to that part of the picture on the left. Right. And then those same words are given to you in Latin on the right. right. So what he's doing is using <clears throat> illustrated book to teach your native language and to teach you Latin. Oh, wow. um, and this was so groundbreakingly powerful that it became the standard textbook for teaching Latin throughout Europe and also in the Islamic parts of the world and in China. Wow. <laughs> Like it was, it was hugely impactful. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. this coupled with his more general writings on education and educational practice led him to be kind of as much as one could be world famous in his day. Right. Um, <clears throat> and and uh, just to say this idea of the sort of bilingual approach to teaching it lives on to this day. I know there, there's some research about the difficulty of second language learning being remedied by greater attention to one's first language for example. It's not exactly the same thing, but there's some kind of echo of that here. Well, yeah, and for me, for Comenius, ultimately, and this is where it gets interesting, this was part of his pan-sophic, which is to say a universal wisdom uh, framework for integrating humanity. Because his goal was to teach you your native language, but to also have every human speaking Latin <laughs> so, that there would be, so that there would be a universal language. Um, and that was a prerequisite for him. Uh, that we couldn't move forward as a planetary civilization without some common language. Um, the, the Esperanto, well, not exactly the Esperanto of its time, because it was so wedded to the church and the Bible and everything else, I guess. Um, yeah, it was very much a Latin-centric uh, perspective. And I'm just, there's a few more, so I just want to... Yeah, so this is the tailor. And so here you're seeing the beginnings of more complex divisions of labor in medieval societies. And... There are other plates that include navigation um, and waterworks like, uh, you know, wheel turning, mills. Um, uh, and it's the same principle here where you're learning about how the tailor does their thing <laughs> and you're learning about your language and you're learning Latin all right. from the same picture, essentially. I just love the, again, on the bit of the left, which I can read, the tailor cutteth cloth with shears and seweth it together with with a needle and double thread. Yeah. It goes on like that. And I guess on the right, that would be... That would be the Latin. Latin, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, interesting. And then there's a bit more, there's a bit more, I think, from Orbit. Is this just your essay? No, hang on. So this is, we'll come back to the Between Worlds image in a minute, because uh, I know you <laughs> want to talk about that. But there should be a bit more in Comenius. Yeah, there's one more. Tormenting of malefactors. Yeah, so this is the one that's kind of amazing, because this one describes in some detail, uh, torture, uh, medieval public torture techniques. Um, so you're getting in the same book where you have juxtaposed like emerging uh, divisions of labor and discussions of the early kind of natural sciences and geometry. And you're getting talks about navigation of the seas to the new world and these kind of things. You're also getting these passages on 
how to break the bones of witches and burn people alive and things of that nature. And why is that? That's because he's still of his time and that's still... Or, or the, idea, the idea being that <clears throat> precisely because he's so nestled between these two worlds, he is presenting in this book the span of both worlds. He's right. showing the old world medieval style stuff right. and the emerging world of division of labor, capitalism, uh, world exploration through empire and things of that nature. Um, wow, it's pretty intense as well. If you, if you, if you read, no, this stuff is it's real, and this is what, and this was, yeah. this wasn't theoretical for oh. Comenius. This was like, if he gets captured, this happens to him, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of stuff. Like <clears throat> uh, a so, case of execution, for yeah. example. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and I think that's it for the for images. Yeah, it's that that lot. And I just you're hang on. This one is the cover of, our, of the main book, right? Yeah, it's the cover of the main book. And again, this book was reissued in some form for close to three hundred years. Right. And it was actually, and it wasn't reissued as a novelty. It was actually used. Like, mm -hmm. um, if you look at the German idealists, for example, like Goethe and Herder. Mm -hmm. Hemholtz, uh, they all were huge fans of Comenius mm -hmm. <laughs> and, th and these books in particular. So these books were his route to a certain amount of power and influence. He, Comenius ended up being uh, kind of courted by all the crowns of Europe to come and reform their education systems. So the Spanish and the, uh, the Swedish, uh, but it was the, it was the uh, British um, uh, that ultimately gained his primary allegiance. And it was interesting. There was a very important trip he made to England where he was kind of bumping elbows with the most highest ranking uh, members of- uh, My five, you said, I think at one point. Say again? You say the, the secret service of the time. Well, the, and this is a subplot, which is that, so the Bohemian brethren were consistently funded and kept afloat through the through the money Comenius received from England, basically. <laughs> uh, and if you think about the politics, the geopolitics of the time, the greatest threat to the Habsburg Empire and the Catholic dominance was the Church of England, basically, and its funding of all of these Protestant startups. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is reason to believe that Comenius was brought into that political intrigue. Uh, and actually that his efforts were sustained in part as an effort against the, pap the papacy <laughs> uh, by uh, Queen Elizabeth, basically. Um, and so he's in England uh, just before the English Civil War. Had the English Civil War not broken out at that time, Comenius was positioned to basically be perched in England indefinitely, recreating education from London. Right. Um, there was an invisible college that was built by him and his colleagues. Uh, this was eventually turned into the Royal Society right. some years later after the Civil War um, ended. Right. Um, so he left England, eventually went to Sweden, uh, and then eventually ended up ultimately in Amsterdam. Right. Uh, and in both of those contexts, continued to do his educational work. But every time he went, and he went to a couple of places, he went to Transylvania, he went to I can't recall them all, but several times he went to locations and Sweden was one of them and was like, okay, I'm here. I'm going to help you guys rebuild your school system. It's going to be a modern school system. Always there was resistance and always he kind of failed. So he eventually pulled back to Amsterdam, began to work primarily on his pan-sophic and uh, kind of like vision of universal reform based on a kind of uh, universal wisdom. Um, and this was a very, very popular project in many ways, uh, as popular as his educational work. Right. And as I mentioned right. in, the, in the book, it influenced Leibniz, it influenced Descartes, um, it influenced some of the major thinkers of the day. Just clarify, the word pan-sophic, I'm looking for the etymology there. So pan is sort of everything, and sophic often, because philosophic would be something to do with Sophia, maybe, or pan- Yeah, Sophia, that's right. Wisdom, yeah, so, wisdom yeah, you know, yeah, philo Sophia, love of wisdom. So. And Sophia would be something like universal wisdom. Okay, basically. which in um, some ways is, I mean, not to be too sort of straightforward about it, but that, that's kind of the work you're doing today in some ways, right? I mean, consilience and education in the time between worlds, although it's a grand aim, and I, I don't mean to imply that you're a megalomaniac, but just that there is something similar about the desire to spread wisdom throughout the world, yeah. Definitely. Well, and also this notion that 
after exiting the medieval synthesis, let's call it, right? When you have no differentiation of the value spheres, mm -hmm. science hasn't gotten itself out as an independent discourse, law hasn't gotten itself out as an independent discourse, it's all together. Once that breaks down, which Comenius was witnessing, once that breaks down, then there is a fragmentation of knowledge, differentiation of the value spheres, and a kind of incoherence of culture as a result. Uh, By value spheres, you mean truth, beauty, and goodness or something else? Truth, beauty, and goodness, and specifically that, that notion that there are fact-stating discourses, which are separate from ethical discourses, which are separate from aesthetic discourses, and that those can go their independent directions, and that something can be true, even though it doesn't fit into our ethical worldview. Um, and it's by our standards kind of like unappealing and ugly, but it can still be true that was science's claim. And it's true, even if you don't like it, like look through the telescope, <laughs> says Galileo, right? right. So Comenius is witnessing that inevitable fragmentation <clears throat> and preemptively calling for synthesis on the other side. Like he wasn't calling for stop the, stop the fragmentation, go back to medieval. <laughs> he was saying, allow the fragmentation, but know that we're going to have to build something that's going to integrate these things and specifically science religion and politics were his like main sticky wickets um because he saw those as going in so fundamentally different directions and that was what was causing the <clears throat> so i mean again this is overly simplistic but in terms of just a, a sort of mental conceptual mapping exercise the the integral quadrant map flashed in my mind there when you said science religion and politics because if i'm not mistaken i mean this is a very crude back of envelope but you know science is often top right religion well it has elements of many things but it's often experienced in the top in the top left and politics would would typically be bottom right but then something about education might be bottom left i mean something like that is the very approximate map of what communities is up to absolutely i mean it's kind of remarkable and that was what was so He's i mean you don't want to look theorist really and I, yeah, he was, there was, he, as I said, he was meta-modern before modernity emerged. Like there was a path not taken with Comenius, right. which could have set up modernity to be less pathological. That's kind of one of the arguments that I'm making is that um, had we taken the fullness of his vision and specifically the cooperative effort that he was recommending between major players in the emerging modern scene, right. uh, you wouldn't have gotten the hegemony of science and the overriding of the economic right. over the political and the cultural. He had already seen that as a possibility and was arguing the cultural overrides the political and the economic. <laughs> so he was seeing these machinations and calling for the broad view. Uh, and it was in many senses a precursor to something like an integral vision, right. but he was also rehearsing stuff that was being done adjacently in the Rosicrucian movement and elsewhere. Because as soon as you got the emergence of the natural sciences and you started to get the breakaway of capitalism, a lot of people on the scene started to see that we were basically between worlds yeah. um, and that one of the things required there is a new worldview mm -hmm. um, that can accommodate this new knowledge and the fruits of new practices and social organization. Uh, and so, so yeah, so Comenius ended up, you know, so he's a world famous educator, but he's also working on this broad kind of integral view of the state of, of human knowledge. And so he articulates the, uh, the pan-sophic college of light or the school of schools, <laughs> which would be basically like, like this, this hub of kind of like scientific, religious and cultural cooperation in the, in the interest of kind of planetary educational reform. Uh, and so that's like the UN as it might have been or something like that. Yes, and that's why UNESCO did the right. retrospectives on Comenius because he was in that context of conversation, he was also one of the first people to articulate the need for something like a planetary governance system. Okay. So I end the paper with a footnote. Padilla, yeah, Padilla, Padilla or something. What's the Padilla, word? Well, what's the Padilla. word used for polis, like, like polis basically? Yeah, like, uh, Padilla. Padilla. Uh, the, the, Terry idea that he's offering, but even more specifically, like you could argue that Comenius inspired Kant, uh, Kant's notion, Immanuel Kant's notion of the that kind of like community of nations. Right. Um, so I conclude the essay with a reference to Comenius's paper, The Angel of Peace, right. which he was invited to write when there was a 
kind of a peace conference happening about the Thirty Years' War, he was invited to write that to address all the crowns of Europe. <clears throat> and it's a striking call for universal governance, basically global planetary wow. governance wedded to a global planetary education system. Right. Right. Um, and so you're just like, wow, you know. These are things that you, you, the developmental psychologist in you. I'm curious to know how you see Comenius because he very much looks like he's before his time. You've already mentioned already he's kind of metamodern before modernity. Um, he's sort of a prefigurative metamodernist or something like that. Um, like what's going on there? Like how can that even be possible? Like possible is the word I want to use. Like is that how does that happen? Like where do those ideas come? Where do those ideas and inclinations come from? Do you, do you see them as having sort of divine origin, maybe, or would you not go that far? I mean, it's it's a really wonderful question, you know. Like, <clears throat> you know, there's many models of cultural evolution. And in those models, you get at least the sophisticated ones, <clears throat> these kind of weird interactions between individual development and the state of cultural development. And so you know, think about how to model that. And so with communists, you have someone who's clearly as an individual, very sophisticated, cognitively, emotionally, communicatively, um, uh, and but working in a cultural code, yeah. if I can use kind of Hansi Freinach's language, which is disrupted and weird, right? So like had Comenius just existed in medieval times, he likely would have just been a great scholastic schoolman or something. But because he was in this cultural context where there was so much emergent novelty, uh, I think that put his unique capacities in position to make really novel <laughs> cultural syntheses, right? And so he was pulling from Renaissance Kabbalah, right? Um, he was deeply inspired by Bacon. It was heretical in some way, I guess, at the time. Which was heretical, but because of the cultural tumult, acceptable I in see. a way, see. you see? Like there wasn't, he was right out of the medieval, yeah. we'll burn you at the stake for exploring new knowledge, but not quite out of it, but, but almost out of it. And so he was able to, I think, have a very broad exercise of intellectual curiosity and like I said, Renaissance Kabbalah and then Bacon and the emergent natural sciences and the Rosicrucians and the utopian literature and a whole bunch of stuff came together for Comenius. Um, and so, yeah, and, and I think for someone like Comenius, it's also not, it's also easy to see, like you're saying, something that, something in his psychology that allowed him to actually be outside of his culture and remain at ease and informed. I don't know how else to say that. I guess, his... I guess we could play with Hansi language if you like, but <clears throat> um, he was living in a certain code that was in some flux, but it was still a code significantly prior to the one we live in today, culturally. He had significant amounts of depth vis-a-vis -vis, um, life experience, loss, you mentioned tragedy, you mentioned travel, you know, responsibility, education, all the rest of it. And mystical uh, prayer practice. Yeah, right, I mean, exactly. practices like his, his, actually his most famous book and the one that's easiest to get a hold of is, <laughs> is basically a, a large, like a long religious parable right. called the, the Labyrinth of the World and the Paradise of the Heart. Okay. It's actually one of the great works of Western spirituality. I've never heard of. Okay, great. Um, uh, it's it's kind of gorgeous, but basically it's a, it's a parable where like this guy comes out of nowhere and he's brought into the, like our world and he's walked around our world to see all the different nooks and crannies in the world. And and this is kind of Comenius telling his story about when he went to all the different royal courts and kind of got up into all the halls of power and he met the doctors and he met the lawyers. And he met the aristocrats and he met the laborers and so he tells what it was like for him to meet all those people. And the, the experience is universal corruption. The experience is universal institutional decay and constant bad faith communication in all the halls of power of the world. It's the labyrinth of the world. But then there's this paradise of the heart. He encounters basically the Rosicrucian Brotherhood uh, and describes a small radical sect of Christ-like humans who he manages to fall in with uh, and he falls into the paradise of the heart. Um, and so this is what I'm referring to. There's something in his 
being that allowed him to face the chaos and violence of his time and the total corruption and the complete simulation of reality he actually uses that word. Uh, and the, and the bad, 400 years before. Exactly, and the bad faith communication. He's able to confront that and yet have refuge in this paradise in his heart, which is some mystical commitment to Christ and God, which he sees himself as fulfilling. Um, and so that's important to get is that some of his courage and I think like the audacity of the vision comes not from the intellect, but from the heart. Um, and so his draw towards a new kind of humanity, right. even though what he's witnessing everywhere <laughs> is total corruption and, and violence and oppression, oh, yeah. still sees that there's this possibility for this emergent new form of human and education is the way to do that, to rehumanize. Right. And just to be clear, that there's a lovely part of your essay. I think I also quoted it somewhere, but the I remember when I studied philosophy as an undergraduate, when you come to Spinoza very early on, you get this expression, and I'm going to mess up the Latin, but it's subspecia eternitatis or whatever, under the aspect of eternity, like how things look. And then in Comenius, you get this expression, subspecia educationis or something like that. Yeah. It's like life under the aspect of education. So, but, but our modern day world is arguably subspecia economicus, right? Which is part of the problem. So No, that's exactly right. That's a really good way to see it, right? That there's, you know, maybe your soul lives under the aspect of eternity, but your body certainly lives in our day and age under the aspect of the economy. Convenience would have us live under the aspect of education. And that's the vision both in your more recent work, but also originally Comenius is, is that and I want to come back now to that diagram because um in some ways that's like you know you could say that what the time calls for is to revert to this subspecia uh educationism I'm sure I'm sorry to all yeah, that we'll some Latin scholars are gonna yeah they're gonna here we are talking about a textbook that educates people in Latin and we're I know I know I'm butchering the Latin um right so exactly you came up with this diagram are you sharing me when you had this in draft form Talk me through what's going on here. The rather striking. This is your way of explaining what it means to be in a time between worlds visually. So talk us through it. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> so this is a deeply problematic figure. <laughs> yeah, they all are, but yeah. You know what I mean? Um, so, but I can speak to it. So, so basically, I'm, this figure synthesizes a bunch of really different, like, pa like paradigmatically and methodologically different views of big history. Right. Say again. I, I, I said you're forgiven. Yeah. I, I, I know what you mean. I mean, you're talking about, you know, um, secular cycles on the one hand and sort of um, what do they call it? Cleodynamics on the other. And, yeah. and all Gebser. Of these yeah, all the, yeah, Arbindo, all these different different right. kinds of bodies of knowledge. But nonetheless, it's interesting, the synthesis. So talk us through it. Yeah. So, so this is an attempt to pull all of these together. And so what this is, is, you know, there's many centuries here between 1400 and 2100. So there's a timeline at the bottom. Uh, and then I've got the, if you take the staircase there, this is lifted basically directly from the wall, uh, world systems theorists. And this is their model uh, after the emergence of capitalism uh, that you get a transition between major economic hegemons that are running the capitalist world system. It begins... Uh, in Venice, then it goes to Amsterdam, then it goes to London, then it goes to New York City, basically. Um, and then there's this question about, well, what, where does it go next? And this is a very open question for all the world systems theorists. And they speak specifically to this time period between 2000 and 2050, where all their data converges, saying like, well, there's going to be another shift. <laughs> but to where? Each time there's a shift, it gets bigger. With the shift to the British, it became global. With the shift to the U.S., it became hyper-global, if you can say that. <laughs> uh, and so, so that's, that's one model looking at historical transformations. Now, what occurred in the transition from, the, from, the, from basically Venice to Amsterdam uh, during that period where when Comenius lived, uh, you also had other things occurring. You had the maturity of the printing press revolution coming into being. Um, and you had uh, that highest one, mythic membership to rationally go at this is Gebser's model. You also had a transition out of fundamental worldview. Um, and so, 
tracking economic dynamics, tracking communication technologies dynamics, and track, tracking worldview dynamics all at the same time. And looking for those periods where worldview, communication technology, and basic economic slash governmental coordination all change together. <laughs> uh, and that happened when Comenius was alive. And my argument is that it's happening again in our period right now. Just to be clear, it's not just that it's happening again, it's that it's, it's the first time it has happened since in some ways. Correct. Yeah. Yes, it's the first time it's happened since. Um, and so... And so just to pin that down, Zach, sorry to interrupt the flow because it always always leads to great places, but just to sort of grasp this point fully, um, you mentioned when worldview, what, would you say economic structure, however you define that, and what technology or information or what, what are the core aspects? Like what are the necessary and sufficient conditions, let's say, for something to be in a time, a phase to be in a time between worlds and not just to be a moment of historical flux? Right. Yeah. And well, that's the thing. So like there are many moments of historical flux. That's mm -hmm. the idea. And by some definitions, the experience of radical historical flux for the people going through it would be experienced like a time between worlds. But it's not by my definition, technically, by my definition, technically, time between worlds affect whole world systems, not okay. subcomponents or cultures okay. within a world system. Okay. Um, and so if I can take a model that we've discussed of infrastructure, social structure, and superstructure, which roughs maply on, which roughs, excuse me, which maps roughly onto something like economic technology, mm -hmm. uh, governance, and social coordination, mm -hmm. and culture or worldview. So those three. So what you're looking at is when all of those three are basically being fundamentally restructured simultaneously and being by historical forces broadly conceived being by historical forces broadly conceived and this is where all of this modeling becomes a little bit dubious because it becomes difficult to talk about the causality like yeah. how does this actually work why is it that during some historical periods there's a convergence of major changes whereas in other ones you're only getting subtle changes to some of the components right um uh and so I think basically the argument is uh, that the last time the social system, the techno-economic base and the cultural realities changed this drastically all at once was around the turn of the 17th century, which right. the time that Comenius was living, when you had printing press, capitalism, <laughs> the, the lead up to the bourgeois democratic revolutions, right. um, and the birth of science and the end of the medieval synthesis. Um, You've got uh, something now. like, I mean, very approximately again, with all due qualifications, but back then you have sort of breakdown in value spheres, emergence of science, sort of spreading of the printing press in the early days of capitalism, um, maybe introduction of nation states. So fairly radical. And then, it, and as a result of that, a kind of general cultural turbulence leading to changes in religious affiliation and maybe intermarriages, or I don't know exactly how you would play that out, but how would you describe the cultural change that happened in Comenius' time? What would, what would characterize it? So you get, so this is what we call the enlightenment, basically, <laughs> right? You get, the, you get the breakdown and the delegitimation of the way societies used to be organized around the divine right of kings and aristocratic rule uh, and the primacy of the church in articulating worldview. Um, and so that's kind of the basic enlightenment uh, transition out of the medieval synthesis. For the soul, for the self, how, how is one experiencing this? Is it, was it, is it experience of liberation, dissonance? I mean, probably it depends <laughs> where you are. I mean, if you were in Bohemia during the Thirty Years' War, it felt like the world was coming to an end, right. like literally. Like there was a, there was a huge rise in millenarianism during this period. Like a lot of people believed that the world was actually ending. Right. Um, and around the time that Comenius was reaching the height of his fame, you had Saptide Zvei, uh, the the Jewish uh, 
basically Messiah, who in 1666 shut down the entire Jewish world because they thought that the Messiah had arrived. <laughs> uh, it's a little known story, but it's a very intriguing moment in history in this same period of time. Mm-hmm. So much of the subjective phenomenological experience of this time would have been that it's the end times for traditional religious believers it would be that it's the end times for the emerging kind of encyclopedists and enlightenment philosophers and natural scientists it would have felt much more like a liberating zone yeah um so i think it's it's very complex and the same thing's happening today like you can see that the the cultural atonement that we're in is being experienced by many people as incredibly disorienting uh demotivating um and uh disconcerting like deeply disconcerting like that the world is ending as they've known it and of course we're also getting yeah please sorry just to try and map them together give a bit of morphology today you know then you had the printing press we around turn of the century give or take we had the internet which you know you know transmutates into social media handheld smartphones and then increasingly into virtual reality and you know ai comes on data extraction surveillance capitalism there's sort of various permutations but at the same time there's a sense of democracy which we once thought was becoming the kind of norm beginning to look like it's fragile and maybe on the way out and then you have these what someone's called infodemics where we can no longer trust our information and struggle to make collective decisions Meanwhile, we're in a different phase of geological time, some call the Anthropocene, but which could be maybe the Capitalocene if you take a more political edge on it. Um, and so you like communities time, you have this massive shift in um, infrastructure, super, um, social structure and superstructure, uh, roughly economy and technology, social relations broadly conceived, including governance, and the inner life of people in a, in a cultural context and they're all in massive flux right um, and community's answer back then was educational renewal and that's roughly your answer now which yes. is why this is why this is so 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 enlivening for you i guess yeah that i mean that's that is kind of the point like when i encountered community's work i was kind of shocked that you know so that he articulated it then as clearly as I'd like to articulate it now, that when there's this much in flux during a historical moment, that one needs to keep one's eye fixed on these dynamics of education, intergenerational transmission, and the processes by which we make ourselves into humans and persons. Um, uh, because when you're between worlds, it's not clear what it means to be a person. And that's why it's a dangerous place to be in many ways. Well, that's actually another good litmus test of whether you're in between worlds, right? Is it yeah. clear what it means to be a person or not? Is it clear what it means to be a person, what the obligations to other people are, what the nature of the world one lives in is? Um, all of those background consensus like, get disrupted. Right. And what that means is a huge opportunity educationally because... Mm-hmm there's a, such a pressing need for greater coherence of worldview and identity uh, and greater opportunity for richer communication as reality gets more complex. So it's kind of one of those crisis opportunity things you have to see when you're in these moments. Um, and again, the, the model here and the figure and even the discussion is in some ways heuristic. I mean, there's many other ways in, right? Like at the same time, uh, there were energy crises during the turn of the 17th century. Really? You know? Well, because the source of energy was wood. Right. But in order to have wood, you couldn't farm. Right. So there was a competition between land used for farming and land used to create energy to burn, which was wood. Um, so you had a crisis at the kind of forefront of urbanization having to do with limited energy energy inputs and so the solution to that was to explore new energy frontiers underground right. and so coal yeah. <laughs> and so you get coal <laughs> uh yeah. and so so similarly like and again there, that's why i'm saying it's hard to tease out the causality because like some world systems theorists uh would actually say no it's actually the energy crises 
that repeatedly drive the thing into greater complexity to explore new energy frontiers and force the technological change, et cetera. So I'm, I'm not opposed to that, that makes sense. We are also now in, of course, energy, major energy crises. Um, so it's, it seems that there are just these like um, thresholds of complexity and most very complex systems have these phase transition moments where there's a tremendous, there's order, the order gets complexified, it gets so complexified that it becomes disorder. <laughs> and then it either reorders itself at a higher level of complexity or it falls into disarray and reorders itself at a lower order of complexity. Which so is that's cat on. yeah, the catastrophic bifurcation. So that's the idea is that, yeah, it's inevitably changing. <laughs> yeah. So this which, is which way is it changing? Education is like the the trim tab, right? Education is the fulcrum it's the it education is the thing that allows us to go one way as opposed to another right so we have this question mark here on the right hand side which is like what happens next yeah. um and i suppose that's what i want to you know begin to close with just to, to ask you about that because um you know you've written about education in the time between worlds to some extent the consilience project is a form of public education in the time between worlds what Perspective is up to is in some ways also uh, an educational venture. Um, but the scale of the challenge, you know, is daunting to put it mildly, right? So you've got, um, you've got lots of people who feel that rather than working at the level of the superstructure um, with what it means to be a person, including metaphysics, including finding some kind of coherence between the value spheres so more experience of beauty more connection with truth and goodness there are some who think look we just got to get web 3.0 sorted out um and or we've just got to tax carbon at the right level so that we can avoid you know reaching climactic tipping points or others who think we just need to find a way to use land more wisely to you know for various ecological reasons um, is your instinct, I mean, I think your instinct like mine would probably be all of these things, there's a place for changes on all fronts, but is there any reason to believe that the, the educational side of it is somehow principally important? Um, or is it, you know, how, what, what is the basis of that case? Um, I mean, I think the, that is my argument, that all of those things are incredibly important and need to be worked on, but that actually a prerequisite for working on those successfully is working on education. But vice versa too. I mean, in the sense that you need a stable political system and you need energy systems to work in order to have, and I'm not gonna say schools because I know you'll, you'll say that's not the point, but right. to have some kind of educational ecosystem that works, you also need infrastructure and social structure to be viable, right? Mm, yeah. And so you're looking at inequitably distributed educational innovation leading to more broadly distributed educational innovation so What's that it? i'm not talking about everyone changing the nature of education simultaneously but i am talking about understanding most of the most complex technical political and economic challenges which need to be solved mm -hmm. having an essential educational component because even if you solve it <laughs> you're gonna to have to explain that solution yeah. to the next generation or else they won't be able to pick it up and even if you solve it or put that law in place like carbon taxing and other things you'll have to explain to the people who are being taxed who have to follow the law why it makes sense to follow the law right um, it's not just the explanation of the particular issue it's like we said in the last conversation these four or five main patterns of um capability and legitimacy and meaning and imagination and uh, whichever the fifth one is but um you know, there are these undercurrents that comprise education that you need to have a functioning society at all to have any kind of effective social organization or self-organization. Yeah. People need and to I, grapple with these issues. Yeah. Well, and it's worth noting that like when we say education, most people will think like a school or something, but that's not what we're talking about. And education is actually also not just a superstructure endeavor. It's right. worth noting. Like, so community is innovated at the level of infrastructure right. with the printing press and the distribution of his textbooks uh, in order to promote education. So in some sense, the educational solution doesn't rule out 
major technological innovations. In fact, that's what I call for. Like, right. uh, the digital is, in some sense, has to be part of the solution here, yeah. um, which means that much of the education reform being called for is actually a trend is a reform of educational technology basically okay. like uh, so then what's the link so is there i mean this might be a little bit beyond the scope and i haven't asked you to prepare it but you know insofar as i understand you know i know that you know you've worked in the past with jordan hall for example and he's very excited about web 3.0 and he thinks that somehow we have to make the the combination of the relationship to money and the fact that the sort of political economy of web 3.0 is endogenous to it and not exogenous as it is now that somehow you know the moment you have the web and okay all sorts of stuff happens but still the infrastructure of the political economy exists mostly outside of it um whereas as i understand it with web 3.0 some people are speaking of it as being the basis of a new political economy. The only reason to bring up that up now is if it's true what you say that education exists across infrastructure, social structure, and superstructure. How does that look? Like, well, give me give me some flavor for what that would might mean. Um, where is education in Web three point zero? Be one way of putting that question. Totally. I mean, it, it's interesting, right? Because. <clears throat> that emergent possibility of digital technology to create a nexus for education, finance, governance, that basically instead of software eating just a little bit of the world, that software eats the entire world <laughs> uh, is exactly the kind of thing that um, communist was facing. It was just different, right? So communist was facing a situation where uh, capitalism was about to eat the whole world <laughs> um, and, it, and it did you know and it, it started out as just some things were handled by market dynamics and then with the printing press and the record keeping that that allowed and all the related things it became clear that we could actually probably with the capitalism could eat the whole world <laughs> and so similarly there's a situation where something so fundamental is emerging that it's going to eat the, the whole world and so i actually kind of agree with that premise i don't know what to make of it and i'm not well versed enough in web three to kind of articulate the various possible futures that that has in store um but i do know that the possibility for virtual reality uh is very double-edged sword from the perspective for education it's just worth noting like teacherly authority is uh, a non-trivial um aspect here um, so when I think about the possibility for AI-based um, educate AI-based virtual reality immersive education, right? So if you think about GPT three, which is a text generating AI, mm. you can feed it everything Thomas Jefferson ever wrote, and then ask it questions as if it's Thomas Jefferson. Now, imagine you're in a VR headset and you've got a really convincing full-bodied representation of Thomas Jefferson who speaks in a kind of booming warm voice and you ask him questions and he talks to you right now some would find that really exciting but I can see that you're terrified by it and I, am I mean I'm, I'm both excited and terrified yeah, yeah, like yeah, I mean part of me thinks like that's the answer like no one reads anymore no one does shit but if you could get these like really convincing educational environments right. where you hang out with Socrates and Plato and and it's actually an AI that speaks exactly like Socrates would speak. So you can see how that's quite exciting, but you can also see how that is in some sense, a complete nightmare from the perspective of embodied teacherly right. authority and intergenerational transmission. Because what happens if someone subtly tweaks that Thomas Jefferson algorithm sure. so that Thomas Jefferson starts saying stuff that's like a little- But it's weird. worse than just tweaking. Like you said yourself, you have this problem of epistemic debt, right? You have this problem yep. of programmers in AI now often working in a way that they don't actually know where the answer, they have theory of this knowledge, they don't know where the answer came from. Exactly. They believe it works, but the test of what it means to work is an ethical one. Right. Yeah. So it's, so that that's an example where I can see it coming fast, like there's going to be major, 
venture capital investment in for-profit VR-based education. Like it's, it's bringing private. Socrates back to life, right? And that kind of bringing thing. Socrates back to life. But now, but we have the Jurassic Park scenario, right? Where it's like, <laughs> careful what you do. Not there. Escape, not quite, but yeah. Well, but you can't, you can't, you can't predict what is going to occur when you create educational environments this powerful. And in the propaganda series on consilience that I was involved with, we give that scenario in that first paper on information war of what happens when that same technology that could be used to like blow your mind open with Socratic dialogue could be used to micro-target political propaganda at you. Um, and so that's that kind of like dance with the devil that emerges as Web3 emerges. Um, well, does this uh, come back, sorry, to, no, but, and, but does this, get, I mean, it just feels like it comes back to power again. I mean, it's a bit dull to say that, but in a sense, it's less about the education or the technology in some ways than it is about who's in control of it and what they're seeking from it. And that's ultimately a political battle or something else too? I mean, it, it is. And that's the, uh, that's the real, that's one of the most important geopolitical things occurring right now is the battle over the future of Web3. Right. Will it be a centralized kind of like, you know, business as usual tech company undertaking? Mm -hmm. Or will it become a decentralized, basically uh, kind of people's movement? that is not for profit. Um, how will that, so. how, what, how will, you know, if you ask me, how will I determine which of the two sides will win a war? I would speak about who's got the better weapons, who's got the better strategists, whatever. Who, what will determine who wins that battle? Uh, I mean, I think the battle is baked in to favor the distributed solutions. Uh -huh. um, That's good to hear. Uh, which is to say like, it's not actually really going to be Web3 right. unless it's built in a distributed way. I Otherwise, see. it will be it's some web, weird web thing pretending to be Web3 web that's web three. I see. I see. Web2. And so I think if we keep the vision of what is possible here and keep holding to that, then the only way to reach it is through some distributed system. Now, I think the sleeping thing here in all of this are the are the atoms so there's bits <laughs> and we can do all the manipulating of bits that we want but at the end of the day that cashes out in actual atoms yeah. and which is to say like electricity yeah. rare earth minerals <laughs> uh and the hardware uh and so that's where i see most of these conversations i'm like well what, what are you guys going to do right because the energy demands on blockchain are way too massive to sustain the rare earth minerals needed to create the hardware and upgrade the hardware are way too difficult to extract the multinational supply chains that create electronics are about to be geopolitically disrupted when china takes over taiwan in order to get the microchip manufacturing supremacy um so part of me thinks like I don't know, guys. <laughs> like, what? Uh, how is this really going to work? And let's not put all our eggs in that basket. And remember that we did education for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years uh, with very little uh, technological accoutrement. At the, at the end of the day, the only material you need for education is a couple people and some ase and asymmetries of, of epistemics. Um, and so, I remember so, yeah. Malala, is it Malala, Malala, the. Um, Girl who was shot shot in Afghanistan, I think. Yes. Pakistan. Afghanistan, yeah. Um, she had a statement, she used to sort of say one root, one pen. She had some kind of mantra like that. Mm -hmm. It was just saying that's all you need. One root, mm -hmm. one pen, one, I mean, it was one chair. I can't remember what she added, but it was very much analog. It was like Yeah, some, and that's another way that goes. Like there's going to be that too. You will get a kind of neo-Luddite reactionary pullback from educational technologies mm. into more you know analog simplistic right. and that's it's hard to argue against that most of the people in silicon valley as i understand it send their kids to waldorf schools yeah. that don't use screens right uh so i think so that's worth noting too is that as much as we can put some hope in a kind of high tech educational future and that we actually really need to pay attention to that because that's coming in most of the energy and, yeah. and money is going there. We also need to keep an eye on the opportunities for kind of quote unquote returning to those more basic forms of analog education. And my sense is that those more value will come to be placed on those the deeper we go into virtual reality, 
um, and then you'll get some kind of cultural cleavage around around that. Um, like I can I could see reactions to Web three being quite profound. I mean, there were people who believed that literally that the images and text created by the printing press were basically created by the devil. Right. Yeah. yeah. By the devil. <laughs> like. Uh, and so I could see similar cultural cleavings um, as more and more people spend more and more time in virtual reality um, that you get more and more people strongly objecting to that practice and demanding a return to uh, non-virtual. Right, non-virtual. Non it's funny, it reminds me of the joke about, you know, a, a woman in China going out for Chinese food or food as they call it here. It's a bit like that with virtual reality. It's like, you know, not exactly. reality or reality as we used to call it. Yeah, well, and, and of course there's problems even in that discussion, like many contemporary philosophers of mind and other things take the simulation hypothesis very seriously, for example. Yeah, yeah. Um, David Chalmers' new book, Reality Plus, is all about virtual worlds and things yeah, like that. Yeah, someone gave it to me. Yeah, I haven't read it yet. Yeah, and so, so that's a whole, and it's way beyond the scope here, but that's a whole other topic of conversation about kind of like uh, the way digital worlds and virtual worlds are disrupting our understanding of this world and the kind of um, like, if I could take McGilchrist against Chalmers, I would say something like the kind of myopic left hemisphere view that could ever entertain the idea that this is the simulation seriously <laughs> uh, is part of the culture now that we actually have people. Well, it's, it's, I mean, McGilchrist would say it, it's, it's a kind of hegemon in a sense, you know, the yes. mix, mix theorists rather a lot, but. It's a hegemon and it's a little bit kind of insane. Yeah. To think that this is a computer. And it's even power hungry in a certain kind of way. Um, although I've seen Ian taken to task for that because at a certain point when you're speaking of a sort of a form of attention grounded in the hemisphere and you start using words like power, you're using, you know, too many levels of analysis mm -hmm. in play, but um, that's interesting all very interesting um but it's way beyond you know yeah, we, that we've gone quite far yeah. yeah but yeah great well listen thank it's really been a very rich chat and um i'd encourage everyone watching to read the essay that's on perspectiva's website it's also in the show notes um and you'll get a better sense of all the things we've just spoken about here and in our previous video part one um i think that's all to say for now is that all good for you zach yeah, totally. I mean, it's it's wonderful to just have an opportunity to bring Comenius back uh, in front of people. And you're sure you're not a reincarnation of Comenius, right? I mean, I, I can't be sure of that. <laughs> <laughs> I can neither confirm nor deny that. You confirm. Okay, good. We'll leave it there. Thanks a lot. See you. Bye-bye.